we're in this series in Genesis chapter 27 now, week number two, where we're considering Jacob and his journey of faith. We're going to see where Jacob goes from grasping to leaning. Jacob goes from wanting to control and manipulate and manage every detail to where he's forced to let go and to lean, to depend, to trust. He'll go on a journey where he's going to learn some hard lessons, and he, in that process, he does indeed go from grasping to leaning. Now, this is a critical episode here in chapter 27. There are few chapters in the Bible that have as much emotion, suspense, and excitement that's woven into it. Of course, this is much more than just a moving story. This is much more than just an exciting episode in Jacob's life. This is the Word of God, and this is a story actually with a subject. We're going to read the, almost the bulk of the chapter in one fell swoop in just a moment. We're going to read verses 1 through 40 because I think it's good to read the whole thing together to get the sense of it. But as I've told you before, one of the things that's important when interpreting the Bible and trying to understand what the Bible is trying to say is looking for repeated words. And there is a repeated word in this chapter. It's actually repeated 22 times, 17 times as a noun, five times as a verb. And the word is the Hebrew word for blessing. So the subject of this chapter is the title of my message, The Blessing. So we're going to consider this concept of the blessing and what it means in Jacob's life, but then also what it means in our lives as well, the blessing. So let's read verses 1 through 40. You follow along as I read it out loud. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food so that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be a me, my son. Only obey my voice. Go, bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food, such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she had put on his hands on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's brother Esau's hand. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. 
So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord is blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he answered, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who who was it that that hunted game and brought it to me and I ate it before you came and I have blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. He said to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is it Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him Lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, this practice of bestowing a blessing is somewhat foreign to our modern context. I've bemoaned to you the popular hashtag on social media, hashtag blessed, right? People often use that hashtag blessed whenever something good happens in their life. Maybe they've got a new car, hashtag blessed. Maybe they have a new job, hashtag blessed. Maybe there's some opportunity or they won a game or who knows what. They always put this hashtag blessed beside it. And it's kind of irritating to me, to be honest. But let's be honest for a second. Some people are more blessed than others, right? Some people have things that other people don't have. Because we've been born in this country, a country founded on freedom, We are hashtag blessed. Why are some blessed with opportunities others are not blessed with? Why do some have abilities or talents that others do not have? Why do some have resources? Why are some children born into families that have fertile growing environments for them that are nurturing? Some are blessed with positive work situations. Blessed, 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 blessed. When considering the reality of these things, we can start to think, because it's a fact of life, there's some natural questions that come, questions that are actually interwoven in this chapter, questions like why? (laughs) Why are some people more blessed than others? Why are some people experiencing blessing when they are obviously walking in disobedience to God, but it still seems they're blessed? These kinds of questions, again, are here And as we consider the blessing of chapter 27 of Genesis, I want us to see three truths that are emerging from the text as we study it this morning. The first one I want us to see is this. Number one, the source of the blessing. That is, the purpose of God. Jacob is the one who receives the blessing from his father Isaac in this passage. And in spite of the fact that there is deception, there's conniving, there's subterfuge, Jacob will be blessed by God, not because of all those things. But listen, Jacob is the one who receives the blessing because God has determined he will receive the blessing. 
The bottom line, the source of any blessing is the purposes of God. That's why anyone's blessed. Jacob had done nothing to deserve the blessing. But here's the deal. Esau hadn't done anything to deserve the blessing either. I always find it kind of funny when someone uses that word, deserve. She didn't deserve that spot on the team. He didn't deserve that promotion as if everything in our lives we receive or we enjoy is only because we've deserved them. That's the furthest thing from the truth. So why is Jacob blessed and Esau is not? Again, it is God's purpose. God blesses Jacob as we will discover, not because of anything inherently good in Jacob. Jacob is blessed because God has purposed to bless Jacob. The chapter begins by telling us that Isaac is very old. Commentators surmise that he's around 137 years old. He thinks his day of death is near. In actuality, he's going to live another 43 years. But since he thinks and surmises, well, my day of death is near, let me go and set things in order. Let me go and get things set straight. He determines, I'm going to bless Esau. He tells Esau, go hunt some game Prepare for me some delicious food. When you bring it to me, when I eat the venison, I'll give you the blessing. Now, here's the thing. Did Isaac know that Esau had already sold his birthright as the firstborn to Jacob for a pot of soup? Did you think Isaac knew that? Of course he knew that. This would have been common knowledge. In fact, when we saw that last week, we, we looked back at Genesis chapter 25 Jacob made Esau swear to him. Jacob made Esau take an oath. You gotta make sure this is a clear decision you're making. This is a undeniable verbal verbal contract we're entering into. And I'm sure Jacob let his mom know and Jacob let his dad know. We made this arrangement in this agreement. Look at it in Genesis 25, verse 31. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. That's the contract. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. This is a fair exchange of goods. A price has been given. It's been agreed upon by both parties. They enter into this verbal contract. It's fair and square. Certainly, Isaac would have known about this transaction. Rebecca would have known about this transaction too. This exchange would have been fully established in everyone's mind. But here's the thing. In this chapter, nobody comes out looking good. Not Isaac, not Rebecca, not Jacob, and not even poor Esau. So what does Isaac do? Isaac plots to undermine this fair agreement that has been entered into by Jacob and Esau. He, he decides to secretly set this plan in motion. So you have to know that in that era, a patriarchal blessing that would have been given from a father to a son, that would have been a very public affair. Now, they would have even invited family and friends to observe this blessing that takes place between a father and a son. That's not what Isaac does. He keeps it very secret. He calls Esau into the inner chambers of his tent. He tells him of his plan, and he intends to bless him secretly. This is not a public thing. This is a private thing. I tried to think of some modern-day equivalents that we might have to try to understand what's happening here. The only thing I could think of was, was a best man speech at a wedding reception. You guys have seen those before, right? And so the best man, hopefully he's of sound mind, <laughs> stands up to give this blessing, this toast, this speech, and, and Good ones will have the best man encouraging the couple, blessing the couple, even challenging the couple. And everybody's listening and everybody applauds when it's over. Very public affair in front of friends and family. That's not what Isaac's doing here. It's secretive. It's behind closed doors. Isaac is willfully trying to bypass and undo what's already been established and agreed upon by these two brothers. And what does Esau do? He willfully responds to Isaac's plan. But it would not come to pass. 
It would not happen the way they schemed. Why? Because, friends, God is behind every detail of our lives. When the two twin boys were in the womb of their mother, God spoke an oracle over those young men in the womb. The older shall serve the younger. Jacob shall be blessed by God and not Esau. God had chosen Jacob over Esau. And they say, why? <laughs> because of his purpose. And with that is perfect. And Isaac knew that. Isaac knew the oracle of God spoken to Rebekah over the twin boys. Isaac knew of the agreement that had been come to between the two sons. Yet he is attempting to thwart God's purposes. He had not yet learned what it took Job 42 chapters to learn of trials and tribulations. What did Job learn in chapter 42 of his book? Yeah. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Right. Friends, there's no purpose of God that any government, any king, any president, any congress, any supreme court, any pastor, any peon is going to overturn. Right. The purposes of God cannot be thwarted. Yeah. And it's the purpose of God. No matter how hard Isaac and Esau try to overturn it. Again, Jacob doesn't get blessed because he wished to be blessed or deserved to be blessed. He's blessed because God purposed to bless him. I love the way the Apostle Paul, commenting on this very relationship between Isaac, excuse me, between Jacob and Esau, he says this in Romans chapter 9. He says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. This is a ringing endorsement of the great purposes of God that are good and they are right. And God's decree still stands with Jacob and Esau in spite of Isaac's planning and in spite of Esau's longing. That's still true today. All blessing you have is because of the kind purposes of God. So what happens? <laughs> In spite of Isaac's plot to bless the son whom he has chosen, God sees to it that the son he has chosen is the one who will be blessed. Man proposes, God disposes. So Isaac is given a blessing to Jacob, his son, in verses 28 and 29. And he gives a, a blessing of prosperity, of preeminence, and of protection. Well, let's look at that blessing again in verse 28 and 29. Thinking he's giving it to Esau, he speaks over Isaac these three elements. Prosperity. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Then a blessing of preeminence. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Then a blessing of protection. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. A blessing intended for Esau spoken over Jacob. But when Isaac finds out that he'd given this blessing to Jacob, some of the strongest emotional language in all 66 books of the Bible is used to describe his response. Look at verse 33 again. Then Isaac trembled very violently. He's horrified. He can't believe it. He realizes in that instant God has overruled my sinful, scheming plan. And he's forced to admit to Esau at the very end of verse 33, I've blessed him, yes, and he shall be blessed. So the source of blessing is the purpose of God. We can try to subvert God's purposes. We can try to thwart God's plan, but all of God's good and perfect purposes will be accomplished. You remember in Acts chapter 26 when the Apostle Paul is recounting his conversion experience on the road to Damascus before the great king Agrippa? He describes 
how Jesus knocked him off his high horse as he was on his way to execute his plans to imprison Christians. That is what Paul says Jesus spoke to him in Acts 26, 14. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Oh, Paul tried to do things his way. Paul had his own plans. Paul had his own strategy, and he's firmly planted to execute that strategy, and Jesus shuts it down. And he says, Paul, you can't kick against the goads of my purpose. You can't kick against the goads of my sovereignty and my plans. And friends, if you're a Christian this morning, this ought to be incredibly comforting to you. It ought to bring you to your knees in gratitude and thanksgiving. Why? Because if you've been blessed by Christ, in Christ, it's only because of the purpose of God. It was simply the merciful purpose of God. We know nothing in us deserves the blessing. Nothing in us deserves the grace. We've done nothing. It's no amount of rule following that's going to get you God's blessing. It's no amount of commandment keeping that's going to get you God's blessing. It is all completely His grace. And this also ought to make us prayerful for those who are far from God. Because the same God who has the capacity to bless the undeserving has the compassion to bless the undeserving. I love what Proverbs 21.1 says regarding God's sovereignty. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Pray that way. Lord God, my family member's heart, my friend's heart, our president's heart is just water in your hand. You can turn it however you want. That's the first thing I want us to see is the source of the blessing. It's the very purpose of God. As the reformers proclaimed, soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. Secondly, I want us to notice the sovereignty of the blessing. That is the providence of God. It is remarkable how in the midst of this shameful and unworthy actions by all three three characters in this episode, God still chooses to bless. Friends, there's not one admirable character in this chapter. This is a deeply dysfunctional family. There is awful codependency going on here. Isaac is codependent on Esau. Rebecca is codependent on her son Jacob. There's this relationships that have broken down. Deep schisms have developed, and there's an overall moral collapse on this family. And this is God's chosen family. This is the line through which Messiah Jesus would come. But God works in and through all those things to accomplish his blessing. Now, the sovereignty of the blessing is the very providence of God. Here's God's providence. And the catechism that our family has learned as children, what are God's works or acts of providence? And the response is, God's acts of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing of all his creatures and all their actions. What does that mean? It means that God utilizes even the sinful choices of his creatures to accomplish his purposes. He does. This is how wise and powerful our God is. Prime example, look at the gospel of Jesus. Were the jealous Jews sinning when they plotted against Jesus? Answer, yes. Was Judas sinning when he sought to betray his friend, the Lord? Yes. Was Pilate sinning when he cowardly acquiesced to the cries of the crowd? Yes. But did God in his sovereignty, according to his providence, use their awful, sinful, blasphemous acts to save you? Yes. This is the sovereignty of our God. In providence, he accomplishes 
all of his purposes. Let's think a little bit about the sinful acts of this family. We've already considered Isaac's in some way as he sought to bypass the oracle of God and the contract that had already been entered into. But think about it. Esau was his favorite, and he's compelled by, amazingly, his belly. I told you we look for repeated phrases. Did you notice the phrase delicious food? It was repeated not once, not twice, but six times in this passage. Isaac loved delicious food. And he just wants some of that mouth-watering meat. So that's what he's compelled by. He had made a God out of his belly. And is it any wonder that his favored son Esau sold his birthright for his belly? Like father, like son. And so Esau, we know, had already shamed the family. At the end of the last chapter, we see he married not one but two pagan foreign wives, which brought bitterness upon the family. But now he's continuing to enter into evil. He joins right in with his father's shameful plot. And every bit as much, listen, as Isaac sinfully plots to defraud his son out of what is rightfully his, friends, Rebecca hatches a sinful plan to deceive her husband. She does something that, friends, many decisive, many competent people do. I'm just going to go and take things into my own hands. <laughs> it seems the Lord needs a little help here to accomplish his purposes. Well, let me go and control the situation here. Let me help the Lord out. Let me move ahead of him a little bit because I know I'm very competent to handle the situation. What is she motivated by? She's motivated by her deep, strong love for her son Jacob. That's what motivates her. She puts her love for her son Jacob above her love for God. My friend Heath Esslinger calls this misplaced passion. Heath, former Division I coach, now full-time with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, the predominant focus of his ministry is speaking into parents' lives, particularly regarding their involvement with youth sports. And he sees over and over again misplaced passion. They do it because they love their child. I can remember whenever I was a youth pastor for the better part of 15 years. One of the greatest tools in youth ministry to expose teenagers to the gospel, one of the greatest tools I've seen in modern-day youth ministry to bring students into an opportunity to grow and really emerge as world changers in their faith in Christ is what's called youth camp. Therefore, I spend a lot of energy and effort on youth camp as a youth pastor, trying to make it the best that it could possibly be, but even beyond that, trying to get as many teenagers to go to youth camp as I could. And I can remember... I would approach parent after parent after parent when signups were going on for youth camp. And I'd say, hey, hey, I saw Johnny's not signed up for youth camp. Why, why isn't he signed up for youth camp? Oh, Troy, he, he's got marching band practice every afternoon in, in the summertime. Uh, okay. <laughs> hey, why can't Sally come to youth camp? I noticed she's not signed up yet. Oh, you've got to understand, Sally has a travel volleyball tournament that week. She can't go to youth camp. And so parent, when your child peels away from the faith, don't ask why. When your adult, adult child has no interest in spiritual things, don't act confused. When your adult child comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, I want you to know I'm basically an agnostic now. Why? Why? They saw you practice agnosticism in your home. Yeah. You put everything else above their spiritual well-being. I just want to provide for my children things they didn't get. I just want to give them opportunities I didn't have. It is love. Yes, no doubt. It's misplaced passion. 
I see it in parents. I see it in Rebecca. She loved Jacob. There's no doubt about it. But that love for her caused her to do things that were awful for his spiritual well-being. How does it go down with Rebecca? She overhears Isaac call Esau into the privacy of the tent. Now, you know, every time Isaac called his favorite son into the tent, she wanted to sidle right up there to figure out what's going on. She hears it. Tent walls are very thin. Isaac is hard of hearing, so he probably talks louder than he's supposed to. She eavesdrops and overhears every single word of his plot to cheat out her favorite son for the blessing. Do you see how deep down this relationship has submerged between a husband and a wife? The devolving there, they're keeping secrets from each other. There's no trust between the two of each of them. They're subverting each other. They're conniving against each other. How far had their relationship declined from what we saw at the end of chapter 24 of Genesis? When the veiled Rebecca is coming toward her groom, and there is Isaac in the field meditating before the Lord. Such love, such affection, such trust and interdependency as they depended on God. It's all gone. And I would ask, is there anything like that going on in your marriage? Suspicion? Distrust? Hiding things from your spouse? A lack of trust? Secrets being kept and kept away? No openness? Maybe even conspiring against one another. That is a dangerous place to be in a marriage. So Isaac makes sinful choices. Rebecca makes sinful choices. Friends, even Jacob, the chosen one of God, the very child of the promise, he makes some sinful choices. The only objection he raises to the whole plan of his mother is what if I get caught and he gives me a curse instead of a blessing? That's the only thing. So he carries out her plan. Jacob comes into his father's tent. And he says, first of all, my father. That's the only truthful words that came out of his mouth. He then says what? I'm Esau. Lie. I did as you told me. Lie. Here's some game. Lie. It's not game. It's two domestic goats they got from the herd. And then perhaps the worst. No, it is the worst lie. Jacob blasphemes the Lord God. Isaac says, how did you get it so quickly? Jacob says, the Lord, Yahweh, your God, granted me success. Huge lie. The sin keeps getting bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. And one thing we ought to learn from Jacob's choice is that massive, huge, gargantuan word, no. We face peer pressure as teenagers and as adults. And when it comes upon us, we've got to learn to say no. Then there's Esau. We've looked at him. We might have a natural sympathy for Esau. We can see his bitter tears. We can hear him cry out in pain. You can feel his hopes are dashed right in front of us. But before we feel too sorry for him, remember, he despised his birthright. He said, it doesn't really matter to me. Give me that bowl of soup. He doesn't accept responsibility for what he had done. And then he says in verse 36, look at it. For he, this is Jacob, has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Not true. He gave away his birthright. And there's a lesson we can learn from Esau here. Bitter tears are not enough. Crying out are not enough. Personal remorse is not enough. Guilt is not enough. You see, Esau wanted the blessing, not the blesser. Esau wanted the gifts, not the giver. He cried over lost blessings. He never cried over his sin. He never truly repented. And what's being communicated behind all of this malfunctioning family? None of us deserve the blessing that God gives. 
And isn't it amazing, after all of this, God doesn't just throw them all away. Forget you all. I'm starting over with somebody else. No, he doesn't. This is the family through whom Jesus would come. The Savior, the Messiah. God is willing, amazingly, to be known as, throughout the Old Testament, the God of Jacob. God condescends to take on for himself the name of this liar and cheat and conniver and manipulator and grasper. I am the God of Jacob. This ought to bring us tremendous hope because just as God will transform his corrupt heart, he will transform our corrupt heart and bless us even when we don't deserve it. That's the beauty of this story. In the providence of God, he carries out his sovereignty in blessing in spite of our willful disobedience. We saw the source of blessing. We see the sovereignty of blessing. But real quickly, I want to show you the spoiling of the blessing, the pain of our choices. See, just because God sovereignly accomplished his purposes in spite of the sin that's rampant, it doesn't mean there are no consequences for the sin. Sin does matter. Our willful disobedience to God does matter. These family members, each of them, endure consequences because of their sin. As we move forward to the book of Genesis, we're only going to see in the following pages just two brief glimpses of Isaac. Then we won't see him again until we get all the way to chapter 35 when it's announced that Isaac dies. And then you're kind of like, oh, oh yeah, Isaac's been alive this whole time. Well, what happens to Isaac? Isaac, the promised son of Abraham and Sarah. Isaac, the child of promise, the child of the covenant. He's left in relative obscurity for 43 years. The last decades of his life, he's put on the shelf and he's no more used by God as far as we can tell from the Bible. What a shame. What a shame it would be as Christians, believers in God, because of our choices, because of disobedience to his commands, we're put on the shelf for the last decades of our lives. Now, God can come and restore what the locusts have eaten, but friends, there are consequences for sin. What about Rebecca? This woman with this misplaced passion, oh, she loved Jacob so deeply, so passionately, she was willing to do all these wrong things. Listen, she never sees Jacob again. He is gone from her life. I've seen that play out in modern times. A misplaced passion of a parent. We don't hear from her again in the pages of Scripture. Her death and her burial is not even mentioned. Interestingly, the death of her nurse is mentioned, but not her death. She's gone. What about Jacob? What Jacob, what consequences did he face? Well, he now has to go into exile because he's tricked his brother Esau, the stronger one. We see that now Jacob will serve 14 long years. The cheater is cheated by Laban over and over and over again. The cheater who cheated his blind father now has a blind marriage and wakes up the next morning and realizes, oops, I married the wrong daughter. Our sin has consequences. Even though we may be the sovereign recipients of grace and blessing, but the comfort in all this is this. Listen, for those who are in Christ, you cannot lose the ultimate blessing. For those who are truly born again, you cannot lose your salvation. Yes, you may lose some of your effectiveness. You may lose some of your opportunities because of choices. We can spoil our life on this earth, but we cannot spoil the grace of salvation that's been given to us in Christ. And how sad it is when Christians, through their own desires and, and choices, they virtually become useless in the kingdom of God. Oh, they're saved, but they've so damaged their testimony. Friends, that's what happens when we go from grasping, when we try to control and manipulate every single aspect of our lives. 
We need to be leaning, depending, trusting. I want to close this message by looking back at the original blessing, the original covenant God made with Abraham. All the way back in Genesis chapter 12, when he first called Abraham, do you remember the goal of the covenant? Do you remember the goal and the aim and the overarching purpose of the blessing God spoke over Abraham? I want us to see what it is. Genesis 12, 2 says this, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's the whole purpose behind Abraham being blessed by God. That's the whole purpose behind the blessing of Isaac and the blessing of Jacob. Friends, that's the whole purpose of any blessing you have in your life. Any opportunity, any resource, any vocation, any ability or talent, the sole purpose and aim of those blessings is so you will be a blessing to others. God intends for us to be a conduit. God intends for us to be a thoroughfare, a pipeline of his grace, of his mercy, of his blessing. So friends, don't kick against the goads of God's purposes. And that leads to my last thought, and this last thought is really the overarching truth of this whole chapter. In spite of all our sins and stupidities, God's determined purposes are invincible.